What is up, you guys? Welcome to the Twink Revolution. I'm Sam. I'm Gian. And we're back within a week. Everyone's wow. shocked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just a second. Let me let me go there. Oh, sorry. These are important important things that must be uh, important traditions to maintain. We're a little out of practice, but you know we can still get one thing right. Yeah, drinking. Drinking. Um, <laughs> what are you What have you been doing, Sam? What's been going on? Um, not much. I've been very like trad. I've been I made vegetable broth from scraps. <laughs> yeah. A lot of cooking. I don't know. Cleaning. Yeah, I I, I uh, made my my first batch of passata, like tomato puree. It's pretty good. First, first the tomatoes, and then it's augmented with some farmers market tomatoes. Pretty exciting, honestly. That's we know this is the content that you uh you show up for. Yeah, garden content. <laughs> um. Yeah, we're going to Vegas. I'm excited about that. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, um, which is why we're releasing an episode today, honestly. Uh, I, a while ago, well, <laughs> while a little drunk, um, please please refer back to the bit about always drinking. Um, I bought tickets to see Morrissey uh, of, of, of the Smiths fame and solo artist fame, which I'm very excited about. I mean, I've, I've always admired him a lot and um i did it to own the libs that's why i bought the <laughs> tickets wait why i mean he's just sort of a figure of controversy he's gay yeah? <laughs> no maybe um yeah I, he he's um he's been accused of being a, a bit fash or like mm. a right a bit right wing or that um people have sort of read into into lyrics and sort of various public statements that he might be a bit of a sort of like british nationalist type type character so do i flash my ass or do i not flash my ass i think you absolutely do okay yeah. um that's politeness yeah so i was meant to go see him many years ago and he canceled and then i had tickets to see him again and he canceled so i'm really excited <laughs> to see if this one actually works you can, you can all hope hope and pray for me that i actually get to see uh morrissey because he's old right he's getting on yeah, yeah. it's pretty in his 60s i'm also going I don't think I know any of his songs, but I'm going to prepare. And by that, I mean, like, listen to, like, two songs right before the concert. Perfect. And then just cheer wildly when, when those songs come on. <laughs> I'll just get gradually drunker and become a woo girl. Be like, woo, we yeah. love you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we have any listeners in Vegas, but we'll be, we'll just be hanging out. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Hit us up. You know where to find us. The rules are kind of stupid again. No, less stupid than the last time we were in Vegas. No, no, though. not allowed to. That that got no, no, no. The, the rules were not stupid, Sam. They were um, good, sound medical advice dispensed by experts. We trust the experts. Uh, that the, we got taken off YouTube the last time we talked about Vegas COVID regulations. <laughs> I'm having a really hard time for upcoming time. <laughs> yeah, our, our last episode, our, our, our two episodes ago, the SOS USA one also got taken off YouTube. It's okay. It went viral afterward. So they really... Yeah, well, Glenn Greenwald the, did retweet me, yeah. me complaining about it. So that did really help. Um, <laughs> yeah, a few other journalists also shared it with yeah. lots of following. So I'm like... Yeah, thanks, you, all. thanks all. You got us, YouTube. The thing we heavily contribute to really yeah i mean it's, it honestly honestly just automatically uploads to youtube i i've never done anything with the youtube i feel like listening to podcasts on youtube is weird but if you do we love you yeah Sorry, it's kind of convenient band. honestly I've, I've occasionally had like <laughs> um uh like something autoplay through youtube mm. and i'm like i'm not going to turn this off i mean the joe rogan experience famously would like release its videos on like a you know, three-hour video of the podcast yeah uh, on YouTube, I think it stopped since the Spotify deal. But he shows like little snippets now, which I occasionally sell out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the best part. If I'm gonna like, if I'd watch a Joe Rogan one, which I rarely do, it's like I'd want to watch like the actual video, and I'm like, I'm not gonna listen to like just the audio. That sounds dreadful. You know, that's yeah. the one of those where it's actually better to they they have faces for rate for video. <laughs> <laughs> a face for video yeah <laughs> um yeah well so you touched on it you've already you've already pushed the hot button so might as well keep going so yes last time we were in vegas 
let me be very careful with my words here. Um, we remarked on the fact that in order to sit in a bar without masks on, you were required to purchase overpriced food items like nuts or chips. Or chips. Um, we thought that was silly. But uh, according to YouTube's medical misinformation uh, community guidelines, uh, that's not silly. That's Ain't actually a perfectly reasonable and legitimate thing. And no reasonable person could disagree with that uh, that particular regulation. They should just do that without the mask. I mean, the chips and like nuts were good. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, when you were paying for them. I know. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so the regulations. These are, oh God, are we doing another COVID regulation episode? I don't want to do it. <laughs> no, don't, don't make me. Oh, don't make me do it. Um, it's okay. We have something new to say, at least, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank fuck for that. It's getting what worse. Are you going? <laughs> oh, oh, good. Um, Democratic Representative Torres um, is introducing a bill. Bill Bilana Torres from uh, Star Trek Voyager, right? The Klingon one? I've never seen Star Trek. Okay. Never mind moving swiftly along. I look like this, bitch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, they're pushing you the look like a Star Trek fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. They're pushing the Department of Homeland Security uh, to put unvaccinated people on the no-fly list. Huh. That's um. You would think dystopian. The mass requirements would stop all of it. Well, I mean, it's so, but like, uh, no, the no-fly list has always been this completely opaque kind of um, piece of bureaucracy, like just n- nightmarish. Uh, security state theater because you it's sort of unclear how you end up on the no flight list yeah it's unclear how you get back off the no flight list or whether that's even possible there's no sort of right for appeal review it's 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 outside of most judicial control as far as i know so it was as fair as saddam hussein's trial <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's very similar the same people came up with it funnily enough um so is it just an odd instrument to try to use? Like, um, I mean, if you can enforce masking regulations through, I, I assume, just sort of government mandate or through, uh, like, I don't know, fucking the, who regulates planes? Like the uh, Federal Aviation the FAA, Administration, yeah. right? The uh, FAA. So, like, surely you already have the inst- instruments to do this. It, it sounds a little bit like, like, fuck it, why not go the whole way? Just, like, put unvaccinated people in Guantanamo Bay. That'd be Like, hot. we have that already. Like, why not just use that? Can they send me to Cuba, but, like, not Guantanamo Bay? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you just want to be deported to Cuba, okay. That'd be fun. <laughs> um, you are, in fact, vaccinated, though, so I'm sorry. You're not getting on that plane. Yeah, because I care about traveling more than, like, bodily health. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's the only reason. Yeah. Um... um so, yeah, no, this is just a bizarre suggestion. I called it early on. I was like, this is going to be the new war on terror. And every new thing. they have one idea. Just like kind of is the same thing. But instead of like Muslims and like animal rights activists, now it's unvaccinated people and COVID um, critics. Well, I mean, it's just our, 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 um, our elites are so, they're so incredibly unimaginative. Mm-hmm. Think about it. You have at your disposal, essentially, sort of all of, all the money, all the power, and you have um, a sort of very compliant, subservient media that will just report anything you say as truth. And you literally can't even come with a new party trick, like using the fucking no fly list as a proposal. Like, good god, yeah, come on, like, like, uh, give me fucking like. I don't know robots with uh, circular saws and laser beams that chase around unvaccinated people. Like, <laughs> let's do that. Like, at least that's something new and ghoulish. Maybe this is like actually a deep-rooted conspiracy of like libertarian autistics who just want everyone to do train travel. It's actually part <laughs> of the Green New Deal. AOC was actually behind um, forcing trains, but she's actually secretly pushing this. <laughs> it's you know, uh, stop flying. Everyone's gonna ride. This is a, um, yeah, what a beautiful new reality. It's, uh, it's Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. Um, the sort of it's increasingly, <laughs> well, yeah, um, it, increasingly 
the uh, our sort of our 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 global you know it, it titans of industry and our our brave political leaders um, have sequestered themselves mm-hmm. and just sort of withdrawn from society. Um, they're just off doing their own thing and having you know. 400 person fundraisers or whatever no masks just vibes yeah like like pelosi's doing or whatever and um everyone else is running on a failing train system it's it's really a beautiful <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful love story um that's true that's hmm. really true yeah i mean i like riding trains maybe not like across the country that sounds a little expensive but like any excuse to get rid of the plane industry sounds fun just because I like Isn't hate that flying. an MIA lyric? Like a mile lyric? I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I think sitting on trains, at least it's an excuse to get rid of the air industry or travel industry. Yeah, I think so. I think that's how that song goes. <laughs> um, What's well, fun, you know? Yeah. Um, we love that our government is really taking care of people. Um, you, you would think it, this is about science and preventing transmission, but we are told... Um, mask mandates and lowering distances actually makes it more efficient which we have no reason to doubt because we're here if you're listening to us on youtube and we're still here that means we don't doubt that at all no wink um (laughs) but it gets better um the the progressive media is also coming out full force the i think it's called common dreams which identifies like a progressive kind of like bernie krat style like um Media is using the American Medical Association's recent um, call for mandatory COVID vaccines as a win for working class people. Mm. You know, an organization that opposes single payer universal health care <laughs> yeah. yet has the audacity to complain about like overbooked like emergency rooms and understaffed workers. Damn. Yeah, if only there was uh, some sort of solution to that. <laughs> like it's honestly it sounds like maybe that the um the sort of anarchy of markets is not leading to a, a, an equitable distribution of strain on healthcare systems. Maybe we should centrally plan those. Honestly, like it seems like we could much more efficiently sort of allocate like resources to hospitals and doctors and pharmaceutical production things if if we centrally planned that. That's insane. I know. Um, <laughs> well, so the AMA agrees with you. Yeah, uh, we're probably probably not allowed to say that on YouTube either. Fuckers. Um, so, uh, I mean, mandatory vaccination is a, a hot button issue. Yeah. Um, certainly not a victory for workers. I mean, in terms of at least, at least not when regarded as sort of, um, atomic units of, of labor value traded as commodities. Like if an individual worker wants to get vaccinated, they, they can, Mm -hmm. if they don't, well, Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've already started seeing it for like, I think it's like healthcare workers are starting to see it. For doctors, it doesn't matter. Um, but for nurses, I think it's around like 50% aren't vaccinated. Um, There's actually a really good TikTok explaining why. And it's not because of like, oh, we don't believe in science or anything, but it's because the way COVID treated nurses built such a skepticism of these institutions of power where they had to wear like masks for like the same mask for like months as if mm-hmm. that really helps anything and like bring their own garbage bag suits and shit. And it's like, <laughs> Oh yes, they're going to trust you when like they're the first ones to get us when you like had no example of like actually caring for them to begin with. And now you're going to fire them. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> I think uh, the, the callousness with which um, this sort of media has uh, treat, treated sort of healthcare workers, right? Particularly of that kind, right? Like, put it this way, um, if you remember when everyone was out on their balconies applauding at 7 p.m. to thank essential workers and, you know, healthcare workers, nurses or whatever, you know, doing their dancing cringe TikToks were, were the true heroes. Now you'll notice uh, actually they're the villains. Yeah. And, and we're tra- we must listen to doctors. Dr. Fauci is a hero. But <laughs> like, and that's actually much more important that we now listen to, to doctors who know what's best for you. Mm-hmm. The medical industry has always uh, had a sort of degree of paternalism embedded within it. And this is where, um, I mean, you, you have now in response to these kind of um, the, the, the social... Uh, or aesthetic preferences of the sort of PMC, 
right? A lot of workplaces now requiring vaccination. So that's already mandatory vaccination for, for many people. I yeah. mean, it's like, do you, do you starve or do you get vaccinated? Well, the illusion of choice, right? I mean, you, you go back into the free market of <laughs> the free labor market and, you know, you can just get another job where they would probably also require this of you. Yeah. Um, it's interesting though that, that that's not even going far enough mm-hmm. for the people who are like, nothing but perfect compliance will do. Yeah. And um, so this is where now, now they're looking at sort of using the use of, of government power, right? To say, no, we, we're just required of everybody. Um, I don't know what health, what health goal they're hoping to meet there. This is like, keep in mind, these are the people who believe that somebody else being unvaccinated is putting them in danger. Yeah. And that's just talking out of both corners of your mouth. Right? <laughs> either, either vaccines are effective, which I, I believe they are, um, and therefore you can probably safely spend quite a lot of time around plenty of unvaccinated people. And like, is there some element of risk? Yes. We, we have quantified that risk. It's like, you know, 0.003% or something of people might die in that situation. You know, sucks to be them. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the, the, there's a religious fervor to this, right? It's, it's these are like uh, Christian missionaries or something like. Is if there's if there's you know unbelievers anywhere in the world, then that's actually doing doing damage to your to your own soul. And this is how these people think. It's fucked. Little Jimmy on the playground, you know, unless he's wearing three masks and is vaccinated, then uh, the world is just not right. And we must crusade. We must we must convert the un, <laughs> the, un, the unbelievers. Yeah, it's insane. I mean especially because it treats everyone like they're the same risk from COVID because it's the most of the people are pushing are like younger people who like don't have the same risk of COVID. And in many cases, like there's far more deadly diseases that we wouldn't do the same oh, no, thing. We can't do that one on YouTube. We can't do it. No, nope, nope, there's never been a, a, de- a disease deadlier than COVID. It doesn't exist. <laughs> do not question that narrative, Sam. The flu. <laughs> no, no, you're definitely not allowed to say that one. No, no, I, I, uh, uh, that's parody in the game. In the game, Sam was suggesting the flu might have similar outcomes. Uh, the liberal fact checkers literally said uh, they used Wisconsin and more people died in 2020 mm. from, or more children. No, dig up, Sam, dig up. No, no you can't we're, say we're it. saying it. You can't say it. <laughs> no, we really need that no revenue from YouTube. Yeah. Um, Yes. No, it was, it was Wisconsin. said more people died in 2020, like, like young people from the flu than it did from COVID because it only really affects old people and like the death kind of thing. And well, yeah, you know, who was dying of not, not of COVID uh, was people dying of overdoses. Wisconsin just released their preliminary report on uh, overdose deaths in 2020. And between March and August, of 2020 so start of lockdowns wisconsin had a, a pretty short lockdown there was a 47 percent increase in overdose deaths Jesus. and that's overdose deaths from like opioids yeah primarily i mean it will of, of that's all causes like but um yeah like to the extent that um and and i've got to say that uh, that report was quite thoughtful in terms of talking about like um loss of social support systems that were keeping people you know balanced or um you know, just the actual stress of social isolation or the stress of the pandemic itself and the, you know, fear. So basically a lot of, a lot of people who might not have been in a great spot in their lives. Well, they're dead now. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, whoops, a daisy. Uh, I kind of, I kind of commented those on, on Twitter in terms of the idea that like what's so fucking annoying about this is that, um, up until even early 2021, when maybe some of the lockdowns were starting to ease, mm-hmm. but there was a strong argument of saying, no, no, don't, don't ease, not the time to let up. Um, third wave or whatever we were up to then, I, I've lost counts of waves. <laughs> um, you would have public health officials, as in the people making policy decisions around health, um, just telling you, no, it's not happening. There's no increase, like, no, we're really actually, actually we think overdose deaths are down. Oh yeah, that was the thing. Do you remember that was the thing? Fucking, I think it was. I th- I, and don't quote me on this because I'm half remembering this, but I think it was Grant Colfax who was the uh, uh, SF public health dude, whatever he is. 
um, was was sort of asked directly about this and said like, no, actually our data says there's fewer deaths of despair. Yeah. Um, Walking it might not streets. have been him, but if it wasn't him, it was some other shithead he was standing next to. It is like talking to like, an audience but like i prepare for you to all actually pretend you're blind and not see that the city is like a fucking nightmare after covid with more homeless people and needles right. and stuff everywhere well yeah and so we could have seen that coming and like just you know just in case people think we're just sort of like black bill nihilists on all of this which it seems to be all we can end up talking about but like um there was a perfectly valid response to covid and it wasn't this no uh you know if 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 once even once the kind of like gray neoliberal ooze that that um these people just exude from their pores had stopped and and thought about like what what would be a sort of a it like a a human centric way of dealing with a, a novel virus mm-hmm. um and that would involve you know balancing risks and also like the risks of shutting down society in a sort of basically ad hoc and unplanned way but keeping it running through you know um, postmates and amazon delivery like amazon work warehouse workers Mm -hmm. like they they could go take all the risks for you 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 can take your dumb email job and go sequester yourself in a house and wear three masks um and like that the the idea that this was a way of sort of just externalizing the cost of that right the people who paid for that safety culture this absolute safety at all costs right zero risk mm-hmm. being taken by these people it's because well i can pay somebody else to take risks for me as in you know gig workers and shit and people who have to go out and work um or i can just uh sort of like reshape society in ways where other people where the risk reward ratio doesn't work out this way as in say you're somebody with a propensity to I don't know, opioid usage mm-hmm. um, and, and your life fucking sucks. Well, actually the, the risks there, you know, the, 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 the benefit or the cost and benefit rather, sorry. So the, the costs of like shutting down all the societies, your life falls apart, all your support systems dry up, all your, you know, ways of existing in the world are gone. And the benefit is some rich fucks you've never met and will never meet and would never have anything to do with you in the first place get to feel safe. Yeah. Well, great. Cool. We have completely externalized <laughs> that the cost of that that safety culture. And and unfortunately, this is still to this day drives every fucking piece of policy we're making, including, you know, a fucking no fly list for the unvaccinated. Who gives a shit? You're vaccinated. If you're on a plane, you're vaccinated. It doesn't affect you. Well, it's all ludicrous because it's just like a power shift, like so blatantly. I mean, like Oregon, I just saw. Was it Oregon or Oregon? I don't know. Um has an outdoor mask mandate now again. And I'm like, this isn't even following like basic science. Like, um, none of this makes any sense anymore. It's just fear mongering, which mostly just like taunts people who are actually at risk. Like my grandparents watch a lot of news. Most people don't watch news outside their generation. And now they're vaccinated and they're still afraid to do anything now because the news is telling them, well, the new thing still can kill you with um, a vaccine when that's not what the data shows. It's still quite safe. Like you might get sick, but you're not going to die. <laughs> and that was, they're all like terrified. And now we see it the same with like children because they're the last group who haven't gotten access to vaccination. And now we're seeing civil liberties groups like the ACLU <laughs> fighting for mandatory masks in schools population that is extremely low at risk lower than the flu um even though the children can still wear masks if they want to there was no ban and they're using it it's disabled or ableist or whatever oh, this i mean the aclu um well i like i don't think any of our listeners would be unfamiliar with their like basically foundation story or their their origin story being very tied up with anti-communism mm-hmm. um but like it to the extent that they even had a civil liberties purpose once upon a time. Do you remember when they just during the early Trump days, they're like, actually, we're not going to defend the speech of Nazis anymore. <laughs> uh, um, you know, whatever they they're they're a shitty NGO. It's and and like this is this is just uh, laying bare what they are. 
right? Which is they are an organization that exists to collect donations from like well-intentioned, well, well-intentioned um, affluent liberals. And what, what, where are the minds or where, where are the dollars of well-intentioned affluent liberals right now? Well, it's in schools. It's in school COVID restrictions because that's, you know, they're about to send, you know, lit, little Imogen and little Reginald off to a, off to their private daycare or whatever. And they're just really worried that, you know, the, the PVC barriers that are up between the, you know, yoga, yoga mats and nap pods or whatever are not going to be sufficient to protect their little angels. Yeah. And so I'm, the ACLU is taking up that issue because that's how you shake down the dollars of these people. But it's so like convenient as well because like there's been like diseases. I remember like when I was in like high school, was, was it, it was either swine flu or bird flu. I can't remember because there's so many new variations all the time. And like literally a calf of my class was like seasons. sick and like all the teachers were like substitutes. They all were sick as well. It didn't close the schools or anything. It's like that was probably worse than like what's going on now for this population. No, 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 definitely not. It is. Uh, no, no, we're not. Sam, no, Sam. <laughs> coronavirus is uniquely terrible. You have to understand that, um, unlike the flu, mm-hmm. which makes you skinny. <laughs> well, which, no, which, which has you know clearly, um, you know, a death rate and a hospitalization rate and which many people shake off, uh, you know, it's very unpleasant. Yeah. But, but many, many, you know, younger, healthy people uh, kind of get through without issue and it's considered a fact of life. Um, n- nobody was ever given the illusion of control over the flu. I mean, I guess you can go get a flu vaccine, but I think everyone sort of knows that those are like, okay, they sort of, they sort of maybe help like coin toss. Yeah. Um, and nobody was ever told that like, look, if you wear a cloth mask, it will provide a super layer of protection um, that through your personal action, you will never die. And that's, that's what this has become, right? Is uh, there's a new, it's the, what I was, what I was sort of saying, right? So sort of the safety, this like safety culture, zero risk theater effectively is such that um, this illusion of control. And if you just make the right propitiations, you eat the right diet, it mm-hmm. taps into perfect like wellness stuff, right? Like, well, if, as long as you like, you eat the right things, you do the right diet, you do the right mindfulness yoga app exercises every day at the right time. You breathe when your Apple Watch tells you to breathe and you do all the right things with COVID. You'll, you will never get sick. You will never die. Yeah. You will have uh, you will have everlasting eternal life, in fact. Um, like vitamin D. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, well, and so it's just, it's not surprising, right? That this yeah. is where we are. I kind of just realized talking about the flu is like this winter before um, COVID really emerged. Do you remember like the flu was said to be really bad and everyone was pressuring everyone to get the vaccine? That was all right before COVID. Did that happen last year? It happened. Wow, rerun. It happened right before um, like we went to like Mexico and then COVID kind of became a thing. I remember that being a really big thing where all of social media and the hmm. media and stuff. And I'm like, maybe he was prepping us. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm like, but it's a kind of like interesting how that culture kind of like could lead up to pressure of medical like um, stuff becoming like slowly built up. And once it becomes like the pandemic, there are people are already kind of primed to like share and pressure others via the media and the social media and stuff to, take things for, for for everything else right well and 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 the 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 disease is liberalism i mean in terms of it's about your individual action your individual virtue yeah um impacting others right there's a there's a strange sort of like calvinism to it or something around this idea of like that um collective punishment will be you know meted out if you if you don't do if you don't sort of live right according to me um, and it's sick. It's like it's it's these these people are sick to to yeah. quote to quote another podcast. Um, you're, you're all vegans, and I said as a vegan, but I don't talk about it because I think it's annoying. But you're all like the annoying vegans, but with COVID, mm-hmm. and you all suck. Not our listeners. Um, you're all great, but 
anyone who believes that who's listening. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and you know, yet again, I just want to reiterate, like we, you know, yeah, COVID's a real, it's a real disease. It happens. It does affect people. Some people get very sick. Some people die. That's 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 bad. Don't like any of that. Yeah. The question is, can you, through your individual action and your individual virtue, mm-hmm. can you fix that? No. no, I'm sorry. Death, death is a a, a part of life. It uh, it happens, and we don't have we don't have individual control over it, and you certainly don't have vicarious responsibility for it. Yeah. If other people die, because you, you know, didn't eat enough granola and drink enough juice and wear enough sandals, or whatever, then like, I'm 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 sorry. I just don't know what to tell you. I I can't I can't personally function in the world where that kind of um vicarious apportioning of blame thing is is how we um dole out moral responsibility I, I have to be morally responsible for myself right and and actions i do control um it's, right. it's about like having agency as a person and this this has all just gotten lost and like it also you know got quickly recuperated into a just a, a, a dumb like democrats versus republicans just like shit lib fest they're all shit lips, to be clear. Yeah. And and it's a trite point to make, except <laughs> to say that like anybody having a fucking fight over um sort of the actual specifics of regulations is is missing the point, which is maybe it's about like who whose responsibility is it to uh to to care for the the people, right? Mm-hmm. Um and you know to the extent that uh, anybody's confused about where we land on this, right? I mean, well, like, there's a reason that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a communist. <laughs> You're literally a communist. I'm literally a communist. No, I mean, well, it's because I don't, like, I don't trust the capitalist class to mm-hmm. do that for us. I don't, I don't trust them to look after us. No. And what you have right now is a bunch of people bleating and asking for essentially what is a, what is a dictatorship of, of the, the capitalists. Yeah to just look after us and, and just herd us little sheep and, and tell us how to live properly such that we will not fear death anymore. And um, it's sickening, and I don't, I don't trust them. I don't trust anything about them, and I don't trust the sort of class, collaborati- cl- class collaborationist losers whose first impulse is to go beg to be controlled mm-hmm. by capitalists, fundamentally but- capitalists and, and the politicians that represent the, the bourgeois state. And it kind of gets perfectly like displayed with the recent Obama Martha Vineyards dinner where all the people were not wearing masks, <laughs> but all the workers serving them were forced to wear masks. Yes. And it's kind of like, this is the thing. It's not about you. It's about them and their well being to make sure they have a healthy workforce to, you know, keep making profits. If you're sick, that costs them money. Right. Like, why would you want that? Well, and, and you know, <laughs> just, just to recall that the, this this period has been the greatest transfer of wealth upwards, I think, in human history. Yeah, I haven't I haven't checked the recent numbers. It's quite I, drastic. Yeah, I mean, it's trillions of dollars basically just left your your pocket and went into the pocket of a very small number of essentially the the owning class. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not even sort of choosing words here carefully in terms of like uh, a, a careful Marxist analysis of of from from whomst the transfer is happening and to whom. Yeah. But, um, but like, be sure it's, you know, pick, pick any terminology you want from those who had less to those who have more. Um, and so if, if you kind of have any sort of materialist analysis, you have to say, what incentive would the people who are receiving all of these newfound riches have to get it back up and running? And why, why, why do they care about it now? Mm hmm. Um, when they didn't before. Well, is the is the gravy train ending? Is that why? And so they just actually have to reboot production, uh, to to get shit running. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, it seems plausible to me. Yeah. It's um. Most of the time, of like rising dissent, and it's an easy way to ensure controls, and also like I mean, kind of connecting to our next topic, like small business who tended to not support the party in power. But went more towards the Trump crowd, like um, was eviscerated during 
um, COVID, which is kind of like a mass proletarianization, which means mm-hmm. it's going to happen because that's the way it works, but not probably not as fast as everyone thought. I think it was in California, around 30 to 40% of all restaurants are completely closed and they're still like more and more are never coming back. And that was under Gavin Newsom, which <laughs> um, is our next topic. I mean, you would think the libs would obviously, the gay libs are like, we must vote against the recall. But you also have social or alleged socialist and communist parties coming out against um, the recall of Gavin Newsom, which it's, I mean, expected, but also like stupid as shit. Like, <laughs> like you would think they'd know better. Like, it's quite clear this part, this guy's not good for the state or for working class people, you know? Um, yes. Gavin Newsom. What a, <laughs> what a character. Yeah. The, so, um, I went, I went, I went and like, I was aware of this man. He is, uh, he's hard to miss. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't quite realize how like his, his real story. So, um, he's very tied up with, uh, the Getty family, uh, the oil barons, basically, mm. uh, J Paul Getty, I think is the current one. The Gordon, sorry, Gordon Getty is the living one. Okay. Who was one of the heirs of J Paul Getty, who was probably the richest man in the world for a while in like the forties and fifties. Okay. They're all oil, oil money. Yeah. Um, Gordon Getty is a San Francisco philanthropist ran the oil business for a while, sold it for $10 billion, something enormous personal fortune. Poor. <laughs> um, he was described as described as a, a family friend of, of Gavin Newsom's family. And then basically funded Gavin Newsom's uh, business ventures that then led to him owning like 27 like hotel and restaurant and distillery groups. It's like this enormous hospitality empire. This is what Gavin Newsom, how he came to prominence. Um, so keep in mind, so billionaire philanthropist who also um, incidentally funded the campaigns of like Gavin Newsom, Nancy Pelosi. Um, I think he's in with Kamala as well. Like all the San Einstein. Francisco shit libs pretty sure Feinstein as well. So all the San Francisco shit libs, Mm -hmm. this guy, Gordon Getty is a billionaire, um, has been funding for decades. Yeah. He's like the guy that for pay the, pay the San Francisco Democrats. Um, then Gavin Newsom got his, got his start. So he's a, an industrialist. So he's now, you know, a business owner, Mm -hmm. um, not a small business owner, a large business owner. Um, Ended up, uh, so Willie Brown, the then mayor of SF, just appoints him, no election, into the like traffic commission or some weird like San Francisco machine position, which is a stepping stone. Then there was a vacancy on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, i.e. the the city council of San Francisco. Uh, Willie Brown just appoints him. Um, Yeah, so yet again, this man got to two, two elected positions without ever being elected to anything. Um, just by being part of the machine. Then uh, he was reelected into that position, but the incumbent pretty much always wins. London Breed, the mayor of San, current mayor of San Francisco, had the same setup where she was appointed to the position mm-hmm. and then won the election as the incumbent. Um, San Francisco loves loves a good incumbent, hence why they've had you know, Nancy Pelosi as their uh, congressperson for like 4,000 years. Mm-hmm. Um so anyway, that's that's the the illustrious political career of Gavin Newsom. So billionaire funds, you're just like, he's like not really a qualified business person or whatever, even like he decides to go start like a wine business or something and family friend, yeah, Gordon Getty just funds it and th- th- then is appointed through, as I say, this giant back scratching operation of San Francisco Democrats to two political appointments Mm -hmm. uh, and then lo and behold becomes mayor of San Francisco. (laughs) Are we shocked that he like perfect machine Democrat? Yeah. It's like this cycle of like funding political mutual back scratching or sort of circle jerk of, of mutual appreciation among these politicians who are all kind of like funded by the same people and all 
just kind of like there to enrich themselves and their buddies and like give each other a leg up. Um, and that's how we were given Gavin fucking Newsom. And, and then he went off and did a bunch of like reality TV shit, like rich guy shit. He's a rich guy. He's he like looks like Trump. Patrick Bateman. Yeah, a little bit, but it, yeah. The uh, last machine. Like, last machine. That's uh, sorry. Like he's sorry. Gavin Newsom is more machine. Yeah. He is, he is truly the, Demo- like the, the ultimate child of the San Francisco democratic party machine. Um, and then, yeah, he kicked around for a while and then, uh, ran as governor. He waited studiously as his turn. I believe he was, you know, yet again. So he's a Lieutenant governor. Mm-hmm. Um, another one of these appointments where like, you don't get that job unless you're part of the machine. Yeah. And then it was it dutifully waited his turn. And then when the governor retired, he became governor. He was elected yet again. Cal- <laughs> Californians like San Francisco love, they love a good incumbent. Um, so he was the the heir heir apparent, the heir presumptive, and um, became governor of California. What would you say he stands for, Sam? Nothing. I don't know. The rich. I mean, everyone views California as like some progressive or socialist or whatever. Usually, the la- the, the like the left libs are like it's very like liberal and progressive, and the right's like it's socialist, communist, utopia, horrible hellhole. Um, but it's just like, honestly, like either. kind of like hilarious. Cause I grew up in Wisconsin, a very like, you know, purple state. And it was in California where I such saw, saw, saw such inequality and stuff that it pushed me away from like my remaining libertarian roots. Cause I was like, this is a fuck system <laughs> for, you know, like for, this is like the like progressive, like utopia. It's like, fucking hell on earth for almost everyone besides the super rich. <laughs> um, but you see left wing party is still parodying this like decades old, like, well, we got to sort part the blue versus the right. Um, Cause we don't have any power. You have DSA LA literally posting. There's no power that can be won for the left in this election, but a successful recall will hand more power to our most barbarous opponents on the fascist right vote no on the recall but let's not spend any time on the campaign we have other organizing (laughs) to do why would you post if you're not going to do any if you don't care like they're literally democrats crypto democrats yeah and also like they're not fascist like they're not doing anything economics wise that's different from the democrats like there's no property taxes because there's it's almost impossible to raise them in this day it's um, the state is run by landlords and PG and E and mega farm corporations. Um, right, and so historic like, water rights handed out as sort of graft years ago. And th- this is what it is. It's a, it's a yeah. state that runs on political back scratching. Well, so like a lot of people have been saying like, well, we have really strong labor here, but all of the like labor unions and stuff in the state for the most part, are also just expenditures of like the democratic party. And in many cases don't even hold the same views as like the masses of working people. It's very bureaucratized and like absolutely like anti-communist and anti like Marxist. Like that's the whole point of these groups is to keep mostly like the working class cocked by the democratic party right? and prevent any actual like, policies or movements that would you know disrupt the balance of capitalist hegemony right well so i mean um i think it was it was you know gore vidal at about 1960 who said you know there are there are two parties sorry there there is one party in this country with two wings it is a party of of capital um first of all right and and so to the extent that um yeah, you have sort of alleged socialist groups uh, trying to explain through very kind of careful reasoning um, out and out casuistry in some sense why one wing of capital is better than the other. Mm-hmm. Why you, as a, as a worker, should support one, one wing of capital over the other wing of capital. It's insane. And yeah, it's, this is, it's, at best these are useful idiots. Yeah. Um, at worst, they're willing stooges. I, I mean, mean I, I have to 
believe, honestly, by the time the the effort these people invest into the Democrats, they they just have like lib brain of like Democrats equals the good guys, Republicans equals the bad guys. And not, I mean, like, I would say even like the um, fedora-wearing libertarians who are like, actually, I don't believe in either party. I'm outside the political compass. They're, they're honestly closer to the truth here. Like, you, you have to repudiate these as equally vile. Right. Um, I've used the example before, like, you, you know, it's like watching a, a child murderer fight a child rapist. Like, we really don't have to... <laughs> Like we we really don't have to pick a pick a side in this and say, well, actually, you know, I prefer that. No, no, you don't. They're, they're, these these are your enemies. Well, so everyone's using like the well, all these Trump like candidates of the Republican Party are running and they might win. Yeah, they'll win for a year because there's another election coming up. Most of the states run by Democrats, so nothing's going to get passed unless they both agree on things that probably they already agree on because all the de- <laughs> Republicans just run as Democrats in California. Right. Just like how Democrats run as Republicans in the South because um, they don't really disagree on much besides culture issues. Right. Which are also like just differences in like how to like brutalize the working class. <laughs> um, but you have like, like DSA we know is like a Democratic stooge organization, like deep connections to like the CIA funding of like the... National Center. Endowment for Democracy. I was going to say the Congress <laughs> no. of Cultural Freedom. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now we have groups like the Party for Socialism and Liberation and the Communist Party of USA and even the Trotsky at some um, World Socialist Web are all saying we need to get rid of, uh, we need to vote no and the recall because of the fascists and the far right. And we might lose all these huge wins for the environment and working people as if, the Democrats gave a shit about that in California, or these things were even real. I mean, <laughs> it's quite fake. Like, it's all very bullshit. Like, there's no actual, like, worker freedom in a capitalist state. Like, it's just kind of different ways to, like, prevent them losing power. Right. And and so um, this comes back to the kind of thing about Biden, right, of the, like, the people who are sort of screeching we can push him left. I can fix him. Mm-hmm. They're doing the same thing again. And if anybody's falling for this at this point, right? Like, you know, ju- just to recount some recent history, Biden was elected. The entire American left was like, it's okay. We can push him left. Um, sure. His record's horrible. Yeah. We know his policies. He, he does not obfuscate or attempt to hide anything he believes. He tells us exactly what he wants to achieve but it's okay. We can push him left. He's the he's the guy we can we can work with. Um, now we have everybody like if, so. If you still believed that, if you haven't seen that the fact that you know the kids are still in cages and uh, organized labor is still fucked, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> these political appointments are just uh, the the same ghouls. So nothing changed, right? The, mm-hmm. the branding changed. Nothing else changed. Um, all right. So now we have Newsom, and we have the exact same. F- fuckheads lining up to tell us no no it's okay this is this is our guy this is the guy we can work with we know how to influence him the bad scary people you got to keep you got to keep us um front and center we we can keep being these rebellious outsiders as long as the really bad people don't get in because we can we know how to influence that it's like no you don't yeah you have no influence. you're politically impotent and like the aclu before them right are actually end up being um functionally anti-communist mm-hmm. because it's simply a way of, of producing a, a buffer layer between pop like popular sentiment and the powers that, that exist. Uh, and then also, yeah, it's just a funnel. It's just a, like a, a, fee, a feeder service for the Democrats. What's also Keep voting fun- for Democrats. So the, the net result is vote for Democrats. Well, they also like routinely were like, we need to remove Trump as if, the issue of capitalism in the U S or whatever was having the wrong person in power versus the whole system. And then I kind of like shift things like, Oh, but um, we need anyone besides Trump. And then we're going to like criticize, you know, Biden or whatever, but like stop talking about yeah, things like push him left children in cages and stuff. And then, or I see a lot of these parties are researching, um, electoralism as a path forward for communism and socialism, which doesn't work. Um, history's shown they all get murdered. 
um, else did or were like capitulate for opportunism to, you know, the, the ruling party. There's not, you can't have workers and the capitalists both being in charge of the state. It's one or the other. Stop tricking people. It's like, oh, you're not revolutionary or whatever. Like, you're not going to do anything. You're just basically keeping everyone focused on electoralism as the way forward. Right. And, and it doesn't work. Electoralism. Yeah. This is, this is not like, I, I, this should just be like baby brain simple shit at this point. I, I don't know why people don't understand the state as you want, as like as it is construed, is a state run by and for the the the, the capitalists for the bourgeoisie. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a site of contention. It's a site of of like conflict occurs there, right between literally everybody else and the people who run the <laughs> state and for whose benefit it is it is run, and. The problem is is mistaking that that particular conflict, um, thinking that that's what's playing out through electoral politics. Yeah, it's no, no. That is not. That is a conflict between two different factions of of capital, that just honestly are like nibbling around the margins most of the time. Occasionally make alliances on anything that matters about continuing to operate the system as it exists. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, the thing is like PSL, like, you know, I, I think they're, I think they're chill. I think I honestly think there's a lot of very like principled people in PSL. Right. Um, this shit makes them look like baby brains. When you start being like, the fascists are um, just around the corner. We got to fight the fa- the fascists. Meaning the Republican party. It's like, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry. If you thought there was an imminent threat of fascism, it's coming from capitalism. It's not coming from the Republican party. It's literally capitalism that produces fascism. Well, I I don't even think it's like the majority of like DSA members or PSL or any of these party members, like the rank and file of these groups are are probably a lot of great people in all of them. Um, But it's all the leadership. Their leadership's all like either DSA is just a bunch of like young idiots who just want like a nicer democratic party or a bunch of people who like inherited these parties through the new left and haven't even reconsidered shifting tactics in a way that actually would yield results. It's just kind of like doing the Albert Einstein, like just keep doing the same thing over again <laughs> and getting the same results. I'm like, well, I don't know what's wrong. It's like, you're what's wrong. Like, and there's, it's much harder for a lot of these older parties where there is a centralist model, like the CPUSA or stuff, Yeah, which is simply the only thing they actually kept in place for like Marxism, Leninism, whatever, is that power shift. Um, and it's like, oh, well, you're all just Democrats. Um, claim to be communist cool well yeah and and um there's there's a there's a principle in 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 mathematics called observational equivalence where it's um if i put something in a black box and i i can't know what's inside the box but i can only observe its sort of inputs and outputs then it's a notion of equality where you know in the same way i say like two is equal to two or whatever um Right, and so we, there's, there's no sort of observational equivalences. If I can only observe what's coming out of one box, and the inputs and outputs, like, or see any sequence of inputs and outputs, yield the exact same results as if I give the same inputs and outputs to some other box that I can't look at the contents of, then we can say those are those are observation equivalent. They're basically equal. Mm-hmm. So the problem is, you rattle rattling and shaking the box, <laughs> but you vote for Democrats, you endorse Democrats, you basically come out in support of Democrats like what what makes you not a democrat like you it is it is yes okay sure you identify as not a democrat you identify as you know oh no i'm a i'm actually this particular micro sect of the left uh but yet you you just behave like a democrat anytime we can observe what that might mean or what mm-hmm. that might do um or it comes with this enormous torrent of kind of cope right which is like Oh, but I'm actually doing lots of this other stuff in addition to behaving like a Democrat. It's like, cool, you're really, you're a really cool Democrat. Yeah, you're a Democrat that does community gardening or whatever. Like, oh, that's awesome. It's cool, also cool, like man. a deep fear of like any intentional acceleration forward in a system that's so stagnant. I mean, like if you think about Brexit, people feared it because it would completely disrupt this kind of like somewhat stable system, and it really fucked it all up. Right. Same way as Trump did, and like. Getting rid of Gavin Newsom, regardless of who wins, because who really gives a shit, um, could actually like accelerate the state to a point that may actually be more opportunistic for working people to mobilize and stuff. But they don't want that. Like they'd want Gavin Newsom 
because they're worried the bad guy might be in power. But it's like it might lead to the conditions that actually changed the whole fucking shit versus like a dragged out, you know, blood, ble- blood pleading of like the working class. <laughs> well, it's bled. It's bled, it bled dry. Yeah. The vampires have already had it um, as a meal. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're looking to husk. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm on the record of saying, um, yes, recall Gavin Newsom. I mean, mm-hmm. one one for being a a, a blundering opportunist um, through through a you know a, a very genuine crisis. Um, honestly, being you know being caught having a, a lobbyist dinner at the French Laundry uh, at a time when he was imposing new restrictions on individuals and small businesses and things in California that should have been enough. His if that child, wasn't disqualifying, then I don't know what is. He also sent his children to a private school in Sacramento while most of the public schools in the state were still closed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I hope he gets recalled. I don't care who replaces him. No. Uh, bring out, you know, the, the worst of the worst. I don't I don't Bring out care. that scary black Republican everyone's calling a white supremacist. Yeah, bring out that, bring out that person. Like, <laughs> who, whoever. It doesn't matter. Bring out Caitlyn Jenner. <laughs> Love um, it. You know what? Like the... Uh, to the extent that you have some faith in electoralism, then there'll be another le- election in a year. S- California is a bureaucratic state anyway, and most of it is done through voter propositions. Like any meaningful policy is done through horrible voter propositions anyway. So don't worry. They won't change anything. If you're a landlord in, in California, you'll be fine. You, No matter who's in power, you'll, you're going to do just fine. You'll be great, Bucko, pal. Yeah, they can't raise taxes, so don't worry. <laughs> your tax, your tax rate will be fine. They can nibble around the edges of eligibility of some benefits programs, but don't worry; those are all bureaucratic nightmares anyway. So it's horrible. Yeah. Um. So, like, literally, nothing's going to change in California. You're just going to have different aesthetics for the first time ever. Yeah. Um. Since since Arnie. Yeah. Um. And that's you know what that might it might be time. I don't know. Um, Should we move on to the next one? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, R&B queen that people seem to love a lot. I don't get it. Um, Beyonce. Wow. I really don't. I'm not a Beyonce fan. Okay. I, 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 I get the, I get the appeal. Early Beyonce, you know, like Destiny Child and stuff. <laughs> like that was good. And like her early career, like kind of like, you know. No, the, I'm not going to pretend she's not talented. I think she's oh, She's talented. talented. I just don't care. Oh, f- fair like her no, name I, is like, I see the it's not for me. I'm not saying it's bad for everyone else. Um, it's for gay geriatrics like me. <laughs> it really is. Um, she wore the Tiffany and Co, which is a diamond company. Um, controversial yellow diamond. It's apparently thirty million dollars. It's canary yellow, and it was worn by Aub- is it Aubrey Hepburn. Audrey. Audrey Hepburn. Sorry. Bad game. Um, and Lady Gaga. She's the first black woman to wear it. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Sorry. There's a little bit of a difference in kind there. It was worn by Audrey Hepburn and Lady Gaga. 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 Yeah. Uh, but Beyonce's the first black woman. And everyone's, you know, has to have their opinions on it. And they're calling it an act of imperialism. And it's returned to South Africa. Um. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Sorry. People are asking for that to be re- for that diamond to be returned to South Africa, to, to return it to South Africa to the diamond companies that still operate to this day, and and like like to whom? Yeah, that's the funny. Put it thing. back in the De Beers vault where they have most of the world's diamonds anyway, and have operated under apartheid and not under apartheid, and just what yeah. the fuck? So everyone's upset. They don't know. It's true cause, but like it's probably a blood diamond because it's from the Kimberley mine, which is like one of the largest diamond mines in South Africa. And people are like, we need to send it back. This is colonialism. She's a queen who's talked about, um, you know, African culture as well as her husband promoting like Africa and the black community and while supporting Hillary Clinton who destroyed Libya. Mm. But um, everyone's kind of like, this is, we need to send it back because it's stolen. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, um, the country's mines are completely owned by De Beers, a uh, European multinational mining corporation, which is owned by an even bigger company. But also the ANC, which runs South Africa, does not want to nationalize the mines. They've, uh, 
a fight like Nelson Mandela calling for it back in the day, they are a fully inlined imperialist party who has no efforts to shift private capital out of the country. So they're not going to do anything. If anything, they'll take it back and then sell it for like probably even more because it's like when more my Beyonce, yeah. maybe 50 million. That'd be great. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> like, I don't know if people know about like, fuck, this is just like, I, sorry, this blew my mind. I didn't click on this article. Mm. Um, so I'm just talking about my house, but like, I, I like, I know a thing or two about De Beers. Yeah. So diamonds are not an inherently like particularly precious thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, De Beers basically mines diamonds They've they consolidated a lot of ownership or at least contracts over diamond mines. They take no risks themselves, and then what they mostly do is lock diamonds in vaults, um, where they they don't because because they're trying to control supply and scarcity. Yeah. Um. Like the the all this like diamonds are a girl's best friend shit. You know, diamonds are forever. Like the reason you believe all of this is fundamentally because of De Beers. Yeah. Um. So they're a private corporation. Their roots, I'm a little, I'm a little fuzzy here. I'm like half remembering things. Um, those who accuse us of not reading books, I do read books. I just also drink a lot. Yeah. Um, and I had not looked into this at all. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, like, keep in mind the roots of like diamond mining in South Africa go back to the age of empire. Like this is not, not a new invention. Like, you would have, you know, the the Dutch East India Company doing, you know, just unspeakable things, and the the Belgian Congo going on at the same time as the establishment of like diamond mining mm-hmm. in in Africa in general or Southern Africa in general. Um, so, like, the idea of giving it back <laughs> is the funniest fucking thing I've ever heard. It's yeah. like it would be like. Um, Nazi descendants demanding that the Lugers that were taken off, you know, as like, uh, you know, war, war <laughs> trophies by allied soldiers be sent back to the modern neo-Nazis or something in Germany. Like <laughs> I, I, I can't even think of a good analogy except say like, watch the actual fuck. Yeah. It's very much funny. Cause like for one, they're pretending like Beyonce cares about, a imperialism or anything when her she track record is like she's a huge democratic party cheerleader for all the wars including those in africa um but also like wow are you what, implying that maybe um being a uh i believe a billionaire now oh she is a billionaire yeah, um that be, being being a an african-american billionaire might somehow I don't know, separate you from um, sort of African people living in Africa, that that might be a different sort of lived experience to, to borrow a term. Yes, it is. <laughs> wow. Shocking. I, sorry. I, I was, um I was trying to do a woke, a woke, and I was just trying to look purely at skin color oh. and this, these politics didn't make sense. But if we were to actually believe that maybe these material conditions might affect um, beliefs, behavior, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It makes more sense, but I don't. But yeah. Get it. Um, before colonialism, I thought I was doing anti-racism. Africa had no class society except the dead. <laughs> there was quite big, like there's, there's these aren't like everyone thinks like Africa is a bunch of little tiny tribes. Um, still to this day, it's like Africa's a rising current, especially like South Africa, Nigeria. Where they have finances and wealth and stuff, it's just yes, not Nigeria to the masses. Nigeria is not a poor country. It's extremely wealthy. It's just not given to the masses. Like I think South Africa's um, unemployment rate right now is forty percent. Mm. Um, you know, maybe the diamond mines being nationalized for the masses could be useful. There's no effort from all these also like fake socialists, like imperialist yeah, I mean, parties. Res- respect to Nelson Mandela, but like, yeah, keep in keep in mind he basically had a very short tenure as an actual leader of South Africa. Mm-hmm. He was in jail most of the time. Yeah. And, and um, he basically disavowed all of his early communism mm-hmm. um, in, in, you know, in favor of building a, a liberal Western democracy and doing dances with Bill Clinton. The only two parties in South Africa actually support my nationalization in South Africa. There's a, there's a lot of resources, gold and platinum and, you know, like, 
diamonds yeah, it's the and parenti line was there like these countries are rich yeah it's, which is uh, why there's people so who are poor yeah, yeah. um yeah. but the only ones that support it are some like south african socialist party and then the economic freedom fighters which is like a, i believe it's split off from the anc of like the actual communists and they're actually quite popular and they support it but it's like these people aren't like being victimized just because of like evil whites and like Europe and stuff. The ruling classes in their countries are fully compliant with the system as long as it benefits them. Like yeah. everyone kind of pretends like, um, like these places being occupied or it's like there's, you know, the occupied and then there's the rulers. And it's like, no, it's more complicated. Imperialism isn't like simple, like good country, bad country, if there's like a bourgeoisie and like an international capitalist market in your country, you are also an imperialist country, just not to the same extent as like the UK and the US, like global North, global South is like another big one. Those are all meaningless terms. They don't tell you anything about class society or who's like actually running all of it. Like, like BRICS has like South Africa in it. It's right. like a rising imperialist collective group of like global South countries we're going to fuck over all their neighbors. They don't care. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I also just like, this is this weird, like reflexive, like I have analyzed the good and the bad people in this situation. And Beyonce should give the diamond back. Let's talk a little bit about a $30 million diamond. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the recent, recent trading history of this diamond, but it has been paid for at some point. Yeah. How is it paid for? I mean, like, Put it this way, if, if, if somebody paid $30 million for it at some point, that might be valued at, but whatever somebody paid for it, right, that money was was from the exploitation of workers, of some other workers, right? That, like, you don't just end up with $30 million through, like, I don't know, shaping diamonds with your own hands. <laughs> um, so you're already looking at stolen wealth, right? And then, yes, I'm sure it has a horrible colonial history of the diamond miners who, you know, under horrible conditions dug it out of a mine somewhere um, and, you know, worked worked 18-hour days or whatever underground. And yes, their, their surplus labor, I mean, they didn't see that $30 million. So that was stolen from them as well. And everybody who was, it changed hands through, their labor was fucking stolen. And then yet again, just to say, you know, anybody who bought it and fucking Beyonce with her billion dollars, where do you think that came from? Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. There's ill. There's there's inequities have been visited upon, or justices have been visited upon, untold millions of people, in order to lead us place where, yes, this this woman is wearing a thirty million dollar diamond, and it's a, it's a giant fucking milestone. Well, yeah, everything has a bloody history because everything <laughs> fucking exists in capitalism. Yeah. Um, like, sell the sell the diamond. I mean, like, uh, as an argument, right? sell the diamond and give the wealth back. Well, unfortunately, anybody who bought it would be buying it with stolen money. Yeah. So who would you even sell it to? Blood money. Like, this whole blood diamond, there's blood on all the diamonds and all of the capital because... There's blood on my fucking beer I'm drinking right now. Like, it's... Well, actually, it's employee owned. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. A worker co-op. <laughs> yeah, that's what it says on the jar. Don't, don't, hire, don't hire Nathan it's, J. Robinson. It's spotted cow. It is spotted cow. It does, it does, <laughs> it, he's right. It does say employee owned on the, yeah. on the can. I don't know if I feel any better, though. It still tastes no. the blood. Yeah. Um, I yeah, I know. This is like, th 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 this is an extension to the point of ridiculousness of the idea of sort of ethical consumption under cath capitalism, right? Like, mm -hmm. people are mad at Beyonce not for having a billion dollars or having a $30 million diamond hung around her neck like that it was presumably paid for through the, the, the blood and the toil and the lives of workers. Tiffany um, owns it. Well, sure. But yeah. Tiffany is built on the yeah. <laughs> blood and exploitation and whatever. Um, you know, that that's like... Yeah, every, every link in the chain is guilty here. There is no ethical consumption to be had and the desire that like well simply by taking this giant you know embodied unit of stolen labor value and giving it back to these other people who are private profiteers um th then the injustice is corrected because what it's in the right fucking postal code like it's in the right yeah. geography now so within the right nation state it's owned borders? by the right bourgeoisie um yeah, fuck yeah God what's damn. also really hilarious because the same time this story came out and got drastic attention, primarily from like this 
you know, Bernie style, like Democrat or like anti-imperialist, like with quotations, like laugh type. At um, the same time, um, Ukraine literally arrested an American man for just wearing a Russian jersey and then put him on a government backed like peace list, which is really kind of like a hit list. I think 300 journalists and people have been like taken out on it. It's like, oh, that got zero coverage. But Beyonce wearing a diamond when it has zero impact on anyone, that gets massive coverage by these groups. Um, one of them is much more recent and playing a real role in the world of like geopolitics, which is Ukraine, the Nazis, and the wars over like Crimea and stuff and anti-Russian attitudes there. You know, we're going to focus on like a Tiffany ad because, you know, they could be good and woke, but they're not. Like, it's just, it's all distraction by people who, like, don't understand how any of the world works. Uh, okay, so so um, I just, I, I, I did a bit of um, quick research to try and bring me up to date on the facts. I had this number in my mind that, that at one point, De Beers, mm-hmm. which is a private corporation, owned 90% of the world's diamonds. What is it now? I think it's probably dropped a little bit because they've been trading a bit more because there's more consumer demand because they were so successful with all their like diamonds are forever shit. Yeah. Um, but I think they still control two thirds of the world's trade in uncut diamonds. Oh, you want to know a fun fact? They were created 110 years ago in South Africa. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so I have a fun fact that's not, we're kind of related in the state of Wisconsin where we now reside, there is actually more diamonds than South Africa but because they were all spread out from Canada via the glaciers, they're basically impossible to mine because they're not consolidated in a general region. Are they alluvial diamonds or something? So I might just find a diamond in the backyard. Farmers find them in fields all the time. That's cool. I love yeah. that for them. Is it, see, you know what? That's an ethically sourced diamond. If somebody's just out walking and finds a diamond that is. and they want to go polish that into a, a beautiful thing for Beyonce to wear, <laughs> then like I'm happy for them. Yeah. The only public mine for diamonds is also in the U.S. It's in Arkansas. Really? It's the creator of diamonds. It's publicly owned and you can mine diamonds there. And if you find them, you get to own them. Also, yellow diamonds are like one of like the most common diamonds. So I don't know everyone is like obsession besides marketing of like canary yellow diamonds. Like they come in every color and red's the most valuable. Beyonce, get a, get a red diamond around your neck at 130 carats. Way more impressive. <laughs> um, well, that's all I have to say about that. Everyone's stupid. Um, yeah, no, but, well, let, let me add one more thing, which is to say, m- maybe don't make um, giant diamonds with names uh, your um, your anti-imperialist cause. <laughs> Unless it's the <laughs> Hope not. Diamond, which kills all of its owners. Well, then it's a good diamond. Keep that. Keep it circulating. Keep the tapes circulating. It's in the, the Smithsonian. Diamond. Oh, <laughs> well, that's not going to do much for me, is it? It's killing the working masses. That's its new punishment. Is that another one we paid for, like the fucking Hall of Statues? Did uh, we buy that? I I think we, I don't know how we oh got my it. God, I really hope we stole it or something. Like that would be. <laughs> <laughs> All the owners kept dying. They I'm looking them. it up now. Fuck. <laughs> how did we get it? Uh Country of origin, India, color mine. Okay, estimated value two hundred to three hundred fifty million dollars. Jesus, it's pretty. I've seen it like a hundred times because I went to the Smithsonian a lot. Oh, interesting. It's the real one. Yeah. Huh. Okay, I don't. I don't see how it uh, came about. It's apparently haunted, but I don't believe in that. But I mean, sorry, got a lot of scrolling, a lot of history. The very story diamond. Yeah, I'm feeling dead. Uh, there was a bankruptcy. <laughs> um, couldn't sell the Hope Diamond. Something, something. It was owned by somebody else. Um, sold the diamond for twenty nine thousand pounds, which is three million dollars today, to a jewel merchant. Uh, then it was in the United States since nineteen o two. And then uh, t- several owners of the gem. Gee, this is great. It was with me, me like half reading a uh, an article. Yeah. So it was sold to a diamond collector on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then oh, to Pierre Cartier for five hundred fifty thousand francs. Um, 
then to a socialite in Washington, D.C. and her husband. Maybe are we getting closer here? I think we are. I just want to know if we paid for it. Um, <laughs> so Cartier owned it for a while. That's sort of interesting. And the Ottomans. Yeah. And then uh, you are. it's not stolen. Oh, she bequeathed them to her grandchildren. And then it's, oh, no, it's, um. so I think it's actually just in a, uh, in, in trust. Oh. Yeah, it's not owned by the Smithsonian. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, I got to the section. It says Smithsonian ownership. Um, <laughs> they say, they think they paid for it. That's stupid. They should not much. They should have just stole it. Oh, it was sent in a, in a U.S. mailbox, in a box wrapped in brown paper as a simple registered mail insured for $1 million. Um, $2.44. So maybe it was donated. Maybe, yeah. Well, yeah, good. no, it was, it was, um, it was donated. Oh, good. So we didn't have to spend well, taxpayer dollars on it. Yeah, I was just worried we paid for it, like the fucking Hall of Statues. What is the Hall? Of, oh, in um, the in the Capitol. Congress, yeah, the one, the one that yeah. everyone's in jail for walking into. They didn't even do anything to them. They, but they walked in. You're not yeah. allowed to. Freedom. Um, <sighs> but we can go to our last topic. Thank fuck for that topic. That's very rational. Um, OnlyFans, a topic we've talked about a lot, <laughs> has um, gone back and forth on removing porn from the site. And recently today, I'll get their comment up, has decided they're not going to do their October removal of all sexual content. And so they said, thank you to everyone for making your voices heard. <laughs> we have secured assurances necessary to support our diverse creator community mm. and have suspended the planned October 1st policy change. OnlyFans stands for inclusion, and we will continue to provide a home for all creators. Um, so this was, um, going back to, it was literally, I think, we had maybe just recorded our last episode or it had come out just before. We yeah, it was the same the, day. Um, yeah, where OnlyFans basically said, we're getting rid of explicit content on October 1st. Yeah. And everyone lost their minds. Um, and so now everyone can go back to being their own bargain basement pimp. Yeah. And four days ago, so this is kind of after the controversy, you know, their money um, makers, you know, girls who show their tits and guys who show like porn tapes on there were upset. And then, they basically say sex that, workers, Sam. You mean brave sex workers? I don't use that word. <laughs> it's libtarded. Um, <laughs> um, they said, "Dear sex workers, the OnlyFans community would not be what it is today without you. The policy change was necessary to secure banking and payment services to support you. We are working around the clock to come up with solutions." Hashtag sex work is work. It's not work. OnlyFans, you're just really fucking greedy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. So they sort of attributed the policy change to um, network, like payment net network changes that were um, coming through from like MasterCard and Visa, which is a very real thing. Like I feel like um, mm -hmm. people misunderstand sometimes that the like um, w when when American corporations seem to run out of uh, that that beautiful American sort of value of like any money is green. Yeah. Um, it's usually because the credit card companies are worried f first about like fraud risk, effectively a chargeback risk where they, they, they may be on the hook for the liability or rather their, their, their issuers may be on the hook for the liability. Um, and porn gets charged back a lot. Yeah. And then they're also just kind of, um, they're giant publicly traded corporations. MasterCard and Visa are both huge corporations worth hundreds of billions of dollars each. And so they have the kind of risk aversion like PR, a version that all major corporations have. They don't want to be in a news story about like a, a you know, a, a school shooter using a gun they bought using a visa card. Yeah. Um, so, you know what they do? They say no, no gun sales, no guns at Walmart. Like, <laughs> well, well, and that's partially it again. This is yeah. like, everybody took that as like Walmart taking a brave stand or a political stance. It's not, it's, it's usually visa saying we just don't want like visa is a middleman. Mm -hmm. They hand out certifications to say you can have a Visa logo on your card and they basically intermediate the payments and they take a fee for doing so. Their entire business value, their $300 million, sorry, $300 billion business yeah. is um, based on brand goodwill. And so 
they'll turn around to even somebody the size of Walmart and say like, mm, no, no, we, we won't like, you can't accept a visa card yeah, um, for a gun. And so Walmart sure enough says, okay, no guns. Cause like how the fuck are people going to pay for them? We like, clearly it's not a big enough portion of their business to make us stink. So they, they acquiesce. Um, so I've seen, um, cause you probably are wondering like, Oh, are they going to change their guidelines? For like, because Mastercard and other banking faint services have quite strict rules, hence why they will cut ties with like companies like MindGeek and stuff, unless they adhere to them. Which is why you saw like Pornhub and stuff get rid of all like amateur content because they weren't fitting the regulations of banking and have thus resumed transactions. It's not about you know pureness, and which is about yeah, they, they don't give it's a about shit liability for like you know funneling money to like trafficking or like underage porn right. um but from twitter i did some people speculating from some of the fans coming out that only fans might become publicly owned and that's how they can avoid the banking issue um kind of as in go public go public yeah yeah they've they've been gearing up for an ipo is what's which hasn't really happened there. for any other like pornographic site um that i'm aware yeah of. they were probably trying to kind of clean up their image a little bit and make sure all their their regulatory relationships were intact or whatever. Um, I mean, the, uh, like, keep in mind these, these people are like absolute vultures. Oh, yeah. They would sell anything if it made a buck. Like, I mean, and, you know, I don't, I don't know about the specifics of OnlyFans. They, they're capable of putting out lovely sounding press statements like anybody else's mm -hmm. written by, a, you know, an army of, um, you know, 20 year olds from yeah, Harvard. 20, yeah, yeah, yeah. Harvard humanities graduates or whatever, <laughs> um, who do their, do their press releases. But like, I don't know, like, fuck, they, they would just like Pornhub or whatever. Like they'll, they'll, just, these companies will sell anything. Mm -hmm. They'll sell, you know, child porn or your grandmother being eaten by wolves or whatever. If it made money, the problem is they have to balance their ability to make money off that against like the risk of, um, laws being made to prevent them yeah. doing business or their profits being impacted by bad press or uh, lawsuits or whatever. Like, so, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, only fans basically did the, they rolled the dice. They thought they could make it on like, um, erotic, tasteful nudes alone. The giant backlash against them. I'm sure they saw their like, subscriber numbers drop as everyone's like, Mar, fuck you only fans. I want to see like in interracial incest porn on my only <laughs> fans. Midgets, like. Yeah, mid interracial incest midget porn is all <laughs> that gets me off. And like, I will not support your business if you interfere with that. And so then they went, well, fuck, okay, the profitability like just doesn't work out here. We, we, we must keep that goodwill. Um, and so that's what they're doing. Like, I mean, the shit's all mechanistic. It's it's like a it's a free market. It's, it's a mechanical Turk. It's a it's a it's a it's a appearing to be a robot, but it's actually got a person inside. Well, it's also funny because this is another app topic where the left or whatever has been like calling this neo puritanism <laughs> as if <laughs> as if anybody people, gives a oh, shit. Which is like also like not well, like a lot of people who are in this like aren't coming from a religious standpoint or neo puritanical. It's just like a pro worker standpoint and recognizing for the most part, these industries are still industries of like sexual slavery. I mean, right. we just have like the better end of the global industry that most people aren't seeing, but it's still available to all these people. You know what I mean? Like the New York, like only fans girl is probably at the top echelon. The one who's making like six figures a month. But the reality is, 95% of OnlyFans users don't even make minimum wage. Right. And we're led to believe, oh, you can make millions from this. I bought my house. I paid off all my student loans. And it's like, that's not true. It's another recruitment tactic, like definitely targeted towards young people um, to recruit them once they're like legal. And I think that sounds insane to people, but like every young person I know knows what OnlyFans is. Right. And you'll go for like, TikTok and Instagram and a lot of these people who are recently 18 or even before 18 will talk about making an OnlyFans once they're allowed. I'm like, that's sick. That's really fucked up. I'm not anti-sex or anti-nudity or whatever. It's like, I'm anti-exploitation like the exploitation and telling 
children right. and stuff. Like this is normal and actually liberating and a good way to make money when it does nothing for like society. Like, <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, there, there is something so sick, right. About the, 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 the vultures, right. That, that say only fans or Pornhub or any of these companies, particularly only fans is sort of, uh, I guess the one we're talking about. Um, they, as you, just to be clear, right. They will make money on anything. It's a mm-hmm. for-profit corporation. This is the motivations of, you know, a, a, a corporation is they'll, they'll sell anything that makes money. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so the idea that there are, you know, 17 year olds close to close to their 18th birthday on TikTok, saying, I, I'm going to show my hole on, on only fans in three days. Mm-hmm. What, like what incentive does only fans have against that? Um, none. They would like that. That's great because there are people who are going to pay them money yeah. to see that content. For the 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 content creators um, are being sold a bill of goods that's absolutely false for most. Yeah. Um, you know what? Some creeps have your whole pics on the internet now that they paid for, and you made you know three dollars and seventy five cents. Um, and then what's what's even grosser, right, is the the cheerleaders for this model who are standing back saying, sure, capitalism has completely failed this whatever random 17 and, you know, 17 and 285 day old person. Um, and they have no prospects in their, you know, shitty flyover town or whatever. But this, this is liberation for them. They get a shot and this is worth defending. Yeah. Um, how disgusting is that? Especially how tied up it is between like consumers of porn and advocates of the porn industry. Like it's a very like oh, yeah. dick, dick out, hand on dick with one and then typing furiously messages talking about how this is actually a civil rights issue with the other. Like that's gross, man. Well, it's even funnier now because Tyga, who, who's like a rapper, um, was upset about the ruling and is actually creating his own kind of only fans which will allow only, sex work. only fans but um it's also going to incorporate cryptocurrency <laughs> oh god and people are like chilling that favorite on. subject and it's like like taiga is like rich as fuck like he doesn't care if he shows like his dick on the internet but all these young people most of whom are going to fail in making a career out of it are going to need jobs and OnlyFans isn't private. We know from like, remember the Noam Chomsky episode we did where one of the girls in the documentary we talked about was like, oh, my entire workplace found out I'm doing OnlyFans. Mm-hmm. Like that still has job ramifications. And a lot of you, a lot of these people like who are like TikTok people and stuff probably can avoid that. I mean, they're not the same people that are typically recruited for like, you know, the sex trade or stuff like that where there's no options and they should be welcomed to like jobs like outside of the right. sex trade versus people like tend to be from like more middle income and like upper groups. They're like, well, I'm just going to be an only fans person who does like TikToks, and that's my job. And it's like, no, no. Well, I mean, it's a pipeline, right? I mean, that's this kind of this like influencer thing. It, it thrives on a sort of like a, uh, sort of like no future youth movement of like this sort of endless um, parade of kind of like young, beautiful people who have no hope in the world. Um, And it's like, cool, let us feed you, feed you, or or sorry, your training, your boot camp, right. Is, is learning to like rack up likes on TikTok (laughs) or something. Yeah. And then the monetization strategy is um, get naked. Like, or do porn, like just uh, do out and outright porn. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, cool. What a, like, this is our social safety net now. This is what you get. You know, the idea of like cradle to grave security or, um, you know, a, a la- labor, your labor being the only thing you have to sell. Well, that's not even true anymore. Nobody wants to buy it. So instead what you can sell is your body or your image. Yeah. Um, and, you see this sort of escalating cycle of degradation, right? I mean, you'll you'll see these. Yeah, you're a, you're a famous TikToker. Well, you know that's worth like that and five bucks buys you a coffee at Starbucks, um, and then 
you can't really make a lot of money on OnlyFans. So then what comes along? Oh, look, it's escorting. And it's only high class escorting. Yeah. Well, it turns out that doesn't pay very well either. So <laughs> turns out like, fuck it. Just, just like, it's just pimping or whatever. And like, great, cool. You're, you're, su- you're sucking dicks for 20 bucks now. How was your TikTok career working out for you? It's also like the new... Fuck like, this. Remember how like the music industry like early on, like in like, I mean, I'm like you know, the early 2000s. As early social, on the music industry, yes. I, well, yeah, that's what I meant. Um, like started just recruiting people who already had um, a following because of like YouTube and the internet. Yes, um, MySpace. OnlyFans is kind of like the new way, I feel like... Um, for like porn studios to recruit because now they actually are bringing an instant audience to them. Um, and there's so much right. talent like, Oh, more people are showing what's available than ever before. And now these companies can just like kind of message people already willing, like cause it was meant to be like, Oh, we're freeing ourselves from like the evil porn studios. And now they're like just intermingled in a way never before. Well, and everyone's a, everyone's a gig worker. That's the funny thing, right? Is that, you know, a, a porn studio is, sure not necessarily glamorous but at least it sort of had the typical structure of you know workers who could withdraw their labor perhaps and mm-hmm. might be able to do some financial harm to to a, a small porn studio right like if 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 a small porn studio had like some small number of people who were there you know quote unquote stars who brought in the business um then those people theoretically not saying this happened often or whatever but those people theoretically could withdraw their labor and and hope to do harm. OnlyFans doesn't care. Law of averages, right? You're you're a gig worker. You're like an Uber driver, mm-hmm. right? You don't want to drive for Uber anymore. Well, don't worry. There's ten people who take your place. Yeah. Um, or you know, oh, you don't want to like you know, DoorDash or whatever is driving down payments to dashers. Well, doesn't matter. Somebody else will take the job. Somebody more desperate. It's about having this giant reserve army of labor, mm-hmm. right? Who can't quite ever eke out a living through the labor market yeah and so these companies have learned a certain arbitrage of like well we can just keep these people on the verge of starvation and we can make huge profits doing so because like any you know you basically pay people starvation wages on one end and then you charge people a premium for the service on the other end and that's uh you know that's the business model and, and it's very successful and it's successful for only fans successful for gig work like deliveries or ride share services or whatever the fuck else it's also like an acceleration this kind of way of like oh well let's say you start and you're like i'm gonna use uber because it also translates but like oh i'm just gonna start driving but now everyone's driving and they want to seem better so i get that five star so i'm gonna start spending money to get like waters or you know fun lights or cords and stuff and they gradually they add more of out of their own pocket right. in the same way like only fans Let's say you start and you just it's show like a whole things, pic. Putting things in pockets. And then yeah. it starts to show like, oh, I'm going to show my dick. And then it's like, oh, my dick with another person. And then it's like sex. And then it's hardcore sex. And it has to keep going because right. if you're not going far enough to keep the clientele things, they'll just end their subscription and go to someone else who's giving it to them or someone who's a brand new face. Someone right. who's the one day younger. And it's yep. like. Yeah. If, sorry. If you're not, if you're not doing triple penetration videos, then, uh. You, yeah, you're not getting my four ninety nine dollars a month or whatever. Like, yeah, what a what a like what a horror show, right? I mean, and it's um, you know, the the porn industry already had issues. Yeah, the one thing it didn't need was a gig work economy. It made it worse. On top of it, of course it did. It makes everything worse. <laughs> um, like, I don't know, not 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 to not to end on a on a on a sad note, but like. There, there is value in a workplace, right? There's a reason that our brave, heroic stories of sort of labor struggles mm-hmm. all take place in workplaces. The abolition of the workplace is precisely the arbitrage that gig work companies are, are, are performing, right? It's that there is no workplace anymore. It's, it's your personal relationship with a giant faceless employer that treats you as a sort of uh, fungible unit of value. And... Yeah, it turns out being able to turn to your left, turn to your right, talk to other people who are experiencing the same labor conditions as you and say, hey, man, this really fucking sucks. Want to go chop off the boss's head? Yeah. Um, you know, I powered a lot of, uh, you know, actual, actual sort of ability to build solidarity and mm-hmm. um, to push back against these worst excesses. And like, 
honestly, th- this shit is climbing to the pod and it's eating the bugs. Yeah. Everyone's um, an intermediary. We're all in the labor reserve. Yeah. Well, th- that's the goal, right? Is to have, I mean, th- th- that's yet as a, a sort of reserve army of labor, right? And the kind of thinking formally is like the lumpen and just this sort of like these congenitally under underemployed right keep help keep labor cheap because you can yeah. sort of have the scab army or whatever well it's like a deep proletarianization of people who like don't actually have the actual power that proletarian people have right because i think everyone just means it means worker and it's a very strict definition of what that means um i don't right. have it on me so i'm not going to say it but like like these people don't really have any political sway because they don't actually get their survival income all from like a, the one employer. They're all just kind of like floating in the midst and in many ways are the reactionary lumpen forces that, you know, fight against worker classes because, well, my sex work is actually liberating for working people. My The, the worker left movement, just a bunch of drug dealers and, <laughs> you know, pimps and prostitutes right. um, on OnlyFans. And it's like, well, that's why you're not winning. <laughs> well, and this and this is the goal, right? Is to turn every worker into that. Yes. Right. It's it's that um you know, it, the the mass outsourcing movement of the like '90s, where the goal was like, fuck it, send your laborer to a contractor. Like instead of hiring somebody here, and we're here is wherever you were, send it to you know, say India or Bangladesh or whatever, like some other country where where the labor conditions are not the same but always negotiated as a sort of um, like totally interchangeable contract as in I can replace you tomorrow with somebody in a different country um, because it's not with an individual, it's with some little shop. Well, this is, this is the game, right? No matter how skilled, you know, quote unquote skilled your labor is. Mm-hmm. If you are a proletarian now, it's, it's exactly what you say. It's deproletarianization is the goal because honestly, even having a working class is too expensive. Yeah, they want things, like and they care. can talk to each other, and they yeah they can have they can have political <laughs> demands. Reduce them all to independent contractors who are these floating, free floating, fungible units of value. Where, oh, you don't like DoorDash? We'll drive for Uber instead. Oh, Uber's not treating you well. Well, that's fine. Go over to Lyft because we can just sort of always replace you. You're just a, you know, you you just go. It's just a market, and yeah. so it's a competitive labor market for people who are not laborers in the yeah. technical sense. They, they sell labor, but they sell labor on like an hourly or minutely basis. Yeah, no one's scary to the ruling class. Like they're actually happy. I think about like more unemployed people and more homeless oh, and more of these like lumpen gag workers who like pose no threat because like even like our, the State Department people like who read like Marxism and like Mao and Stalin and stuff, no, like if they're people like this, power the rest any of you. They're yeah. the only one group can actually challenge them. And if we can greatly disintegrate that group to a smaller and smaller portion, just easier for them to maintain power in the long run. Right. Yeah. Do you do you do not um you do not have to negotiate with an individual. Mm-hmm. Particularly if every other individual is desperate. Yeah. So, so that's, you know, that's the goal, right? Is the evisceration of the working class now. And that's, that, that's an overstated term, except to say that like, I don't know, um, say you're a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> like why, why is you, why are you not next in some ways? They kind of are already. And right. The small business owners and these um, petty bougie people are sl- being crushed at the bottom to be right. proletarianized only to be like lupinized in the very end. Right. Here's a free startup idea. You know, it's U- Uber, but for doctors <laughs> just make doctors like bid for the lowest, the lowest price to, uh, you know, see a, see a patient. Um, they are the new ambulance. So yeah, great. So fuck it. Like, yeah, we're, we're done. Well, uh, with that billion dollar startup idea, uh, I guess we're done. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, good night, friends. Um, and a happy note. Good, good night, good night, fellow proletarians. Briefly, yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.